My name is Emily Martin, and I'm taking you behind the scenes to talk to equine artists from around the world. This is Artist Unlocked. Ah, the day is finally here. Before we jump into the episode, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for watching this. This show has been my project, my child for the last couple of months and I'm so so excited to bring it to you guys and because this is the premiere episode I just wanted to lay a few things straight about me, who I am, and um, what to expect in the show going forward. So a quick little background on me, my name is Emily Martin, I am the owner an artist behind Frost Studios Equine Art. I got my start in the social media side of the model horse hobby in 2015 on Instagram. So from there, I've grown and I'm still growing as an artist. And so one of the things that I really wanted to bring into the hobby is the process, the behind the scenes behind all of your favorite artists, whether they're sculptors, painters, tack makers, um, doll makers, all different types of creators in this hobby because we have so many talented individuals and I really wanted to share that. I am currently a college student, I'm 21, I have one more semester left. I think I say that to anyone and everyone that I can. <laughs> But I am a film major, and so I have these skills in the realm of film and video, and so I really wanted to kind of combine my two loves, model horses and video, and bring you guys a show that might help you if you're looking to customize. You get to see the behind the scenes of an artist's process. You might get some tips and tricks. I really want this show to be a place where we can discover new people and new artists. I want to interview um, artists of all ranges, from the new guys all the way up to the veterans. So I really want this show to be a place um, where all different artists can share their story. So without further ado, our very first episode is Harriet Preston of Divine Justice Studios. She's a UK-based artist and sculptor, but she didn't start out that way, and you'll find more about that in the episode. Her Instagram account has over 18,000 followers, and above all, she values authenticity and transparency when posting her works online. Just a quick disclaimer, this episode was filmed with Skype, which is what I was using when I first started doing the interviews, which I later found out was really Really messing with my audio side of things so normally this would be a much more of a back and forth and you would hear me respond to her more and less of like question answer question answer but um, because of the audio quality I just had to restructure the way things were either way I think you can really get a lot out of this episode and I really hope you guys enjoy so tell us about you and how you got into the hobby okay so my name is Harriet Preston and I run Divine Justice Studios. So I started in the hobby in about 2015. That's when I sort of got into collecting. Previous to that, I just like owned briars as a child, um, but I didn't really know that you like people collected them or showed them or anything like that. So yeah, so in 2015, I started to um, collect just with just as like regular run briars. I was about 17 then I think but here in the UK uh, briars are quite rare so you don't really like to see them out and about in like stores or stuff so in order to collect them you kind of had to know about the hobby so uh, when I was really young like six they were in toy stores then and that's where I first saw them and obviously I was like this horse mad little girl so I was like oh my gosh this is the best thing like these are amazing but they were super super expensive so I saved for months and months to be able to buy one when I was like six and I remember so vividly going to the toy store and this wall of them and we just like picking one and it was their banjo um which I, who I still actually have <laughs> uh, but yeah but then they just disappeared because horses in the UK are obviously still really popular but it's not like the US um, and the toys were just too expensive so yeah they've sort of disappeared it's quite sad <laughs> I think I had a few and then we used to go to the US a lot on um, holiday uh, to Colorado so I then discovered like Walmart and they had loads of classic briars and it was when like Spirit and Rain were coming out and the like wild Mustang ones with the like cougar and stuff so I remember we would buy them and in our suitcase on the way home it would just be full of like plastic briar horses because <laughs> I couldn't get them. We just, yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> um, so yeah, so that's like how I sort of got into them as toys. But yeah, it wasn't until like 2015 that I realized they were kind of more than toys because obviously I was getting older, so I wasn't playing with them, but I still loved them. So it was really cool to find this part of the hobby that isn't so much a brand playing with them, but more like seeing them as like art pieces. So that was really cool. How was Divine Justice Studios born? I feel like in the summer of... I don't know if it was 2015 or 2016, but I just started uni and I was going to my first show the like, following May and I just bought an Extreme Justice resin, the, the jumping horse, and I really wanted to show performance. So I was like, oh, it's going to be really good. But obviously, I didn't really want to use Briar Tack and like, LSQ Tack was really expensive. So I was like, well, I can't afford to do this. So I was like, so I'm going to make my own. Um, and yeah, that was when I decided to start my Divine Justice Studios as a tax studio uh, because I couldn't afford to buy <laughs> other people's tax. So that's kind of how it started. Um, and then it just sort of progressed um, into like the showing. I was I'm a big performance show, like that's what I loved. And then I started to see like customs, like re-sculpts. And I was like, oh, those are cool. I want them, but again, couldn't afford to buy them. So I was like, right, I'm just gonna have to make them. I think in 2016, I got, my dad bought me my uh, airbrush for my birthday and like compressor. So I started that, but being away at uni, it made things a bit difficult. So I didn't really get into it much. Um, my Instagram was just sort of pat making and like collection photos. But then in the summer of, I want to say 2017, 2018, I started to like properly try and customize and re-sculpt. So that's sort of like how it progressed. I like started very much with just tap making and slowly evolved into these other things. And now I like rarely do tap making. So <laughs> funny how it sort of changed. Did you ever get to the point of selling your tack or did you just do it for fun? Yeah, so originally it was just to performance show, like that was my main goal. There was no other like reason. But then uh, that first show in 2016, I actually won like Supreme Champion with my like setup. So I was kind of like, wow, this is cool. Like, I'm actually not too bad at it. So that sort of motivated me. And then people, because the UK hobby is really small, um, like people know each other and then they'd be asking me like, where did you get this? Like, will you make me some? So I sort of just dabbled in it a bit, but tap making to me is very stressful. Like if people think customizing and painting for me, tap making is stressful. And I only enjoy it to the extent of doing it myself rather than for others. So. I think I sort of progressed away from that quite quickly. Sometimes I might do it for a friend if they're like, can you make me this? So I'll be like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, like what makes it stressful to you? Um, I think I'm quite a perfectionist. With customizing, there's so much artistic license. Like, of course it needs to look like a horse, but you can sort of choose a bit more about it. Tap making, if it doesn't look right, it's very obvious. Um, and like an English saddle, like a jumping saddle is an English saddle. There's not that much variation. Um, and I think also there are some incredible tap making artists. And I used to look at my work and while it was good, I'd be like, oh, I'm just not. I got to like a certain point of being good, but couldn't get past that. So yeah, then I just sort of moved away from it. <laughs> do you still like to performance show now that you're just customizing? Um, yeah, I still do performance show quite a lot. Um, I'm real big into like these big elaborate setups that are like always way too over the top. Um, but I don't enjoy it as much as I used to because I like showing my customs now and the satisfaction of like I fully made that. I mean, most of my performance setups, I've made everything like either painted or re-sculpted the horse, made the tack, made the jumps. Um, so I do enjoy it, but it's not as easy to just turn up and turning up and just putting a horse on the table and like knowing the work's already been done. It shows with performance, obviously it can go really wrong and then like it puts you in a bad mood. So it's kind of like, I try and enjoy shows now rather than stress yeah. them. What was your journey into customizing like? First horse I actually finished um, was Whiskey Rebel, my bronc. And I finished that to take to Briarfest Fest in 2018. So I feel like I did him in March, May of 2018. So yeah, so that was like my first finished piece. I was like, yes, I did it. So yeah. <laughs> Your first, so was he like just the first one that you like finished and you had like a bunch of others that you just got discouraged with? Yeah. 
I've had a lot um, that I, like, I did, never started out easy. I wasn't like, oh, I'm just going to redo a mane. It was always all the legs, the head, everything is coming off of this horse. So I have a lot of older horses that have no legs, no head, a half re-sculpted with the head is like four times too big for the body. Like when I was just starting and had no idea what I was doing, but don't ever see the light of day anymore. <laughs> but I never fully managed to get one to a point where it had all the legs, the head, the mane, the tail or anything like that. Okay, cool. So Whiskey was your first one. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know he's, I mean, at least for me, he seems like he's pretty popular. <laughs> yeah. I seem to really love him. Um, and so you you said you took him to Briarfest. Yeah, I did. Wow, okay, so then and how did he do? Unfortunately, so this is my first ever Briarfest. I'd never been before to see because I'm in the UK, so going is kind of like a huge experience. So it was my 21st birthday and my uh, BA graduation, so that was cool. Um, so yes, we went over, but on the way I packed my horses in the suitcase that obviously I was checking in, in a way that I thought would give them space. So they had loads of clothes around them, but I thought I'm not going to cram them together. And whiskey unfortunately broke in quite a few places. So I remember arriving being like, oh, this is so annoying. So I tried to fix them up, but obviously I'd arrived with like minimal fixing things. So yeah, obviously he didn't, he didn't do very well. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. What are your favorite and least favorite scales to work in? Yeah, uh, like the collector scale. So um, I don't know what it is, like paddock pal size sort of thing. I I'm not, but yeah, like medium size. Yeah. <laughs> That's like so many names. <laughs> Um, I think I enjoy the size of traditionals more. I mean, don't get me wrong, in the smaller scales, like really talented artists pack so many details in there. So I admire that hugely. But for me, I find the size like more tangible. I enjoy the scale of it and with the amount of de details I can personally put in it. And um, especially with the sculpting, I just, I don't know, there's just something about the size that works for me. Maybe it's because most of my collection is traditional scale. Like I have very few minis. Um, just especially like OS minis, I don't have that many. Um, so yeah, so I just prefer traditional scale. I think when I like something, it makes it easier for me to work with it versus if I personally aren't that interested, then I don't really choose it that much. <laughs> yeah. No, I totally get what you mean. I like painting micros, but again, I do do some commissions of micro, uh, but mainly for me, just because I quite enjoy like flashing the colour on and being done like an hour later and I'm like woohoo that was easy I'm done now <laughs> um, right. but they're never they're never like detailed because I don't have the patience of working that small I have like a magnifying lamp and everything but no they just don't hold my heart unfortunately <laughs> what's your favorite and least favorite part of the hobby I think my favorite aspect is its aspect is the creativity of it um seeing the, these like incredible things that other people make and I like, sit there and wonder like how why did you think of that like how did you think of that that always really inspires me so if I see someone's made this like beautiful piece it makes me want to get back to work so like if my creativity is maybe dipping a bit or my motivation helps me get back into it um so that's probably my favorite thing obviously like there's hobby friends and things like that so that's obviously amazing um and my least favorite is probably the like judgmental aspect obviously it shows like things are judged but it's like fairly i think social media obviously while i love it because i have a social media account which is how i share my work i find the negative aspect of it the way it impacts other people kind of upsetting i'm quite lucky or maybe i'm just like oblivious to things that i don't really get involved with like drama and never like have too much hate and if I do I just ignore it so I don't really care that much um but it upsets me when I see like my friends like leaving Instagram or stopping doing something they love because of the way other people are behaving like that is sad and it's sad that something that is meant to be built on love and because why else would you collect horses I mean you don't have to do it so um yeah it's sad when you see people abandoning it because of like other people because I mean this hobby you could do it quite happily just by yourself like there's no need to have the community but the community is like such a benefit to it so yeah I feel like that is that's my least favorite part <laughs> what are your best memories so far in the hobby I don't I have so many like best parts I think like 
Showings, I do love, especially like when I get to show my own work, that's always amazing. Whether it does great or terrible, like I still enjoy being able to look at other people's horses and things like that. But for me recently, one of my like best moments, um, which if you like follow my Instagram, you've probably seen is when I got my storm watch. So I love the like sort of parts of the hobby where people achieve something that's maybe like meant for them. So my storm watch, um, in my first show that I mentioned in 2016, I went and my uh, cross country entry was in the Supreme Championship. And the winner of like the artist resin um, group was also in the Supreme Championship. So in the UK, I think we do show like groupings a little differently, but basically that's what it was. Um, and I saw the horse and I was like, oh wow, it's amazing. Like it's beautiful. So I took a picture and sent it to one of my like best hobby friends, Zoe Antrobe. I was like, what is this horse? And she told me it was a storm watch now. And then she told me how much they sold for. And I was like, oh, I'm never going to own one of those. Like, it's beautiful, but I'm 18. I have no job. I'm at uni. There's like, I it feasibly would be like stupid. So I like forgot about it, moved on. And then as I like progressed through the hobby, these horses that were once like in my wildest dreams, I could start to sort of start buying. So I was like, oh. And then in 2019, I put out a wanted ad for a storm watch. I wanted an unpainted one because obviously I like to paint my own horses. Um, but I was like, but I might consider painted horses. And this lady in the UK uh, said she has a painted storm watch that she'd consider selling me if I was interested. So she sent me a picture and it was the same storm watch that I'd seen originally. And I remember thinking like, I don't care what the price is, this horse like needs to be mine. Um, and thankfully, like, it, it was so reasonable that I was, like, shocked. So I, like, sold whatever I could get my hands on to be able to buy the horse. And then it was even funnier because I actually went to university quite close to where this lady lives. So she was like, let's meet up um, and exchange, like, the horse for the money rather than posting it. So I was like, great, this is saving me, like, custom fees, shipping fees, like, it's going to be great. So my friend at uni who isn't, like, in the hobby, she likes horses, but had no idea about, like, horse collecting, came with me, like, on all these trains to go and pick up the horse. And we met the lady in a McDonald's. <laughs> surrounded by it was packed and we just sat at this table and she like got the horse out and I got like the money out and we like switched it across the table like some sort of drug deal and everyone in McDonald's was like staring at us like what are they doing <laughs> and then yeah so I got the storm watch that I had once seen that I'd fallen in love with like three four years before so yeah that was cool for me so tell us about your workspace um, so like, I've always done art, so we have like a separate building to the house that the upstairs is my dad's office and like half of it was like my art studio for when I was doing like GCSE which is like school level art and stuff like that. Um, and then my art desk slowly progressed, the art stuff sort of slowly got moved away and then like an airbrushing booth arrived and then that sort of got moved and then like a sculpting area progressed so it's really nice that I have like a permanent quite large area where I can sculpt and paint and all my like bodies are up there so it's a nice bright uh, studio basically um, that I've split into like different sections so I can dremel and sculpt and then keep like a clean well attempt to keep a clean painting area and um, so it basically means I can make a huge mess and not have to worry about cleaning it up which is great. <laughs> I think it's hard because like the creative process in like its nature is messy like you don't finish something in a day like I'll maybe do part of a horse and you don't want to have to pack everything away to then get it back out the next day so yeah so I'm really grateful that I have like, that space that I like to be in as well unfortunately it doesn't get wi-fi so that's why we're not there now um but yeah <laughs> what medium do you primarily work in um so in terms of painting I pretty much always start with like airbrushing and acrylics. Uh, I like it, it's smooth. I, it's not easy because the airbrush is the most first, like, frustrating tool, but it's really helpful for getting like the blended tones and like shading. So that's definitely what I use. I use um, artist quality acrylics. I'm not too fussy on the brand, whatever's on sale really. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I use like Winsor & Newton and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, an airbrush for me is my number one tool, the one thing that I couldn't do without is, is that. Um, and people always ask me like, how can I get like a good quality cheap tool like 
stuff like that. And it's hard because I think with an airbrush, while you can get really good, cheaper ones, I've had, that's my first airbrush I've ever had. I've never had another. Same with my compressor, it's lasted like five years now. Um, so it's an Iowater Eclipse and Iowater Ninja. So definitely recommend those if you're looking at buying an airbrush, even if it's your first airbrush, because you're never going to regret having a good airbrush to begin with because a better airbrush means less problems normally. Um, so yeah, so that's definitely one thing I uh, recommend to like, if you're starting out and you want to get into airbrushing, definitely get one of them. Um, and then I, I do use oils as well, not on every horse. It kind of depends what color I'm painting. So if I'm painting a chestnut, I probably will use oils because it brings like a nice glow. So I use that after I've airbrushed. Um, obviously that's a much slower process and it's still something I'm pretty new at. So. Um, it's just sort of something I'm trying out um, and I do sometimes use pan pastels if I'm trying to do like a dappled effect I'll either do them in oils or pan pastels because I don't understand how anyone can do uh, dapples on an airbrush that just blows my mind because my airbrush and I are not that good friends um, we, we do flat coats that's it no, no dapples um, but yeah so that's basically what I use in terms of painting um, the pretty simple like always the same thing so pan pastels for the brand of that oils again just like any artist quality oil um i don't use drying mediums or anything like that I'm very basic <laughs> um and then in terms of sculpting i use uh, aids epoxy sculpt basically because that's all we can really get in the uk we don't get magic sculptor so um i just use that for convenience really <laughs> but it's good i like it so yeah what are some common misconceptions that people have had about airbrushing and what challenges have you overcome with the medium? So when I first got it, I remember being like petrified of it. Like, because obviously, as you say, it's really expensive. And also it, it looks really delicate and everyone's like, oh, don't drop your airbrush, don't bash your airbrush, don't put your airbrush down dangerously. Like, do you know what I mean? It's, the scene is just like really fragile thing. No, my airbrush has been through a lot and it's never broken. I've never even replaced the needle on it. So yeah <laughs> so as long as you clean it so i don't clean it between each like paint color i just clean it at the end and use the proper like airbrush cleaner so it's not just water when you spray it it smells a bit gross but it's fine also as well um if you need to do that you can always take it outside so like if you have an extension cord you can take the airbrush outside and just spray it like that in terms of mess um, they don't, I think people think they spray really wide. They really don't. Like the spray area is probably like this um, and then down to like really fine. So unless you're like holding the button and waving it about, it isn't really going to go everywhere. Uh, I do make a mess, but that's mainly because I don't use the cap on the top of the airbrush because like taking it on and off when you're like changing the paint is a pain for me. Um, so if I do like something violently and I fill it up quite high, then obviously I slosh the paint everywhere. But I'm not a very careful person in terms of creating a mess but I think if you're careful you shouldn't create a mess I also built out of like cardboard like an airbrushing booth because I was originally afraid of like getting it everywhere but I recently got rid of that because you really don't um but yeah in terms of fumes I don't wear a mask when I airbrush I probably should so if you're gonna start you, you should do that um but yeah I don't um and it's not bad the only thing obviously is like the fixative so I use gel coat definitely spray that outside and same with primer definitely spray that outside so i think as long as you do those sorts of things outside there's no reason why you couldn't airbrush in your room i don't have like a ventilator or like anything like that what are your favorite tools to use in terms of painting i pretty much just use like primer airbrush um good artist quality brushes for me are a huge thing i go through so many so i don't spend a fortune on them but like I want ones that are gonna stay so the brushes stay, uh, sorry, the like parts of the brush stay together well because I find it so difficult to paint like white marking something when the brush is frayed. And I think like if you're getting into customizing, you probably don't think of stuff like that, but yeah, having good brushes, keeping them clean, like well looked after is super important. Uh, good quality paint, I will always like advocate because I think people often choose like 
cheaper craft store brands which of course like if you're starting out and you don't have a big budget like fair enough but if you go for the more expensive paints you're gonna run into less problems and you're gonna like it a lot more so that means if you like it a lot more you're probably gonna push through like the beginning stages I mean I'm not gonna say you're gonna be like a pro to start with but if you can jump a few of the hurdles by using the good of product like better products then you might like it more and continue with it so it makes it worth it um for me customizing wise my dremel is a huge like favorite um at uni obviously i couldn't take that with me so i was using like a hand saw and sandpaper to do my customizing that's how i did stud muffin that's how i did whiskey everything was hand like sawn off i remember sitting like on my university bedroom floor with the horse between my feet because i i don't think people realize when you're sawing something if you don't have like a good grip of it or like pressure on it it takes forever to get through especially like a solid leg or a solid solid part of the horse's body so yeah a dremel i can definitely recommend investing in um get the like most powerful one possible because i had a dremel i think it was like the 3000 or something and after like a couple of months it like burnt out i feel like it was a problem with the dremel but i know a lot of people have had that happen so yeah so the more powerful one's definitely uh, a game changer <laughs> do you have any tips for artists looking to do what you do now um i think my biggest tip is lower your expectations when i first started i like knew that i wouldn't be good but i kind of still expected to be good like i had these like unrealistic expectations that i would suddenly when i started using pastels would create work like nikki button and that obviously doesn't happen because like that's they put years and years into their work and that's why they deserve to be good so i think if you're starting out don't get discouraged that your work doesn't look like anyone else's because your first attempt is not going to look like that um i think you have to take small victories and maybe focus on say you want to be good at airbrushing focus on that don't get distracted by trying like a hundred different mediums like i kind of did because you don't get good at any of them uh so yeah so you just got to keep practicing and don't be obsessed with trying to figure out like how other artists do it i get this a lot like people always ask me how i do stuff and i'm more than happy to tell people but it still isn't going to look like how i do it straight away because like that's my method of like how i've come to do things i found what works personally for me and like i've tried what other artists do and i just it doesn't work or i don't like it um because that's not my style so i think if you can develop your own style of doing things uh, like naturally and find ways that work for you it's always going to look better because you're not try- you're not like focused on copying someone else you're just doing your own thing and therefore it has like more soul and character in it and you can see that it's not like a rigid copy and stuff like that so i think yeah just just keep trying <laughs> what's one thing you'd like to see more of in the hobby the one thing i love about the hobby is um like the national painting month and things like that and the sculpting month where you get artists of all calibers come together like first timers that don't even know like what primer is or how to start painting a horse to like the top names in the hobby sharing information and and just giving like help and support to each other so i'm not saying like we should have more events like that because i think that's very special but i think the like sharing of like critique when it's asked for is really like amazing and just encouraging each other because i think on instagram it's easy to scroll through things and obviously like you comment on things that are really amazing but maybe like if you see something that you know someone's tried really hard with maybe it's not the best custom you've ever seen maybe it's not even that great in terms of like what you think but if you can just spread a bit of positivity and tell that person they've done a great job and like to continue that it means a huge deal like i remember when i first started out if i got like one comment i would like freak out because i was like this is amazing like someone's seen my work and noticed it um and i think that yeah that's how artists become artists like how they progress so yeah, so that's something I like to see and I'd love to see more of really. I think that's another thing that people on social media, it's really easy to just say the first thing that pops into your mind. Like if you see a custom and you yourself know that maybe if they did this differently, it could be better. It's e- very easy to say that, but as an artist myself, I know sometimes if I post something, maybe I'm not totally happy with and someone comments on that part of it. I, like, I don't want to like throw a tantrum, but do you know what I mean? Like you're kind of like okay like i get it thank you i I noticed it too but like 
So I think you need to be careful. Uh, only I only ever offer critique when it's asked or so if someone's like, how can I improve? And then always state like a good part about it and how they can improve. Because I think it's so like creativity is really fragile. It's really easy to like knock someone out of their streak, even like beginning artists. I know sometimes I do not want to paint or sculpt because I just, it's, I'm not feeling it. And when you're in that sort of mood, it's very easy to like take offense to things that people are meaning in a good way, but it's not always necessary. So yeah, so I think people need to consider um, how they say things and if they need to say it. <laughs> Overall, what makes the hobby so special? Uh, for me, it's like my creative output. I do it for no other reason than I want to. I think that's quite special about the hobby because like in our day-to-day -day lives, we do things because we have to. I mean, hopefully we enjoy those things like going to work and stuff like that. But the hobby, no one's forcing us to do this. There's no reason to do it other than like you have a passion about it. So for me, that's really special to have something in my life that is just purely selfish, essentially, um, because I like it. Um, and I'm a creative person by nature. My, both my degrees are in design. Um, I used to do like fine art and stuff like that. So this is an output for me, like that's different to my professional output, which is like uh, design. There's something a bit more fun and playful, I guess. So that's why it's special to me. What are your future goals? Um, so in terms of my account, I don't really have goals because never in my wildest dreams did I think it would be like as big as it is or, or whatever. I remember vividly when I first created Divine Vista Studios Instagram account. Um, and I remember when I hit 100 followers, I thought I was like, this is amazing. Like, I can't believe it. Um, it was like insane to me. And then when I hit a thousand again, I was like, what's happening? Like, why are there so many people following me? So I think as it's progressed, I, I, I'm still shocked at each, like as it grows. And um, which I think people don't think like big accounts are, like they don't like, I'm really grateful and still super surprised. So I just let it do its own thing. I don't really post for any other reason than because I want to. Um, and if people want to follow along and see what I do, then that's awesome. And, and if I can help people by like, I don't know if they ask me questions and stuff like that, then that's great too. But I just sort of leave that to do its own thing. Um, and I just create what I want to create. Um, but in terms of like creative goals, um, I would love to do my first original sculpt. It's, it's I love re-sculpting, but there's something about doing an original sculpt that I really want to jump into. But the leap between re-sculpting and original sculpt is quite a big gap. Like people are like, oh, why don't you just do it? And it's like, yeah, I'd love to. Um, I think the thing about it that scares me is the like armature building, because if that's wrong, then I feel like it's all going to be wrong. So that freaks me out a little bit. Um, but I hope to maybe start that this year. I've, I've made like a head of something and like part of an armature. So I just kind of need to just do it. That's probably my biggest goal. Um, and then in terms of like a mini goal, um, my friend, Carol Warwick, who created um, some of the jumping resins. So Jigsaw, uh, Gas, Spin Off. She's done quite a few, Gumnut, different jumping resins. Um, and I are doing like a collaboration. So I'll be reworking one of her jumping resins and then we'll be releasing it in resin again. So it's quite fun because it'll be like a semi-original sculpt. So it's kind of like a stepping stone across, so yeah. Promote yourself and your work. Where can we find you? What upcoming projects do you have that people can look forward to? So my main like platform is, as we've mentioned, Instagram. So that's my like Divine Justice Studios. Um, I do have a Facebook page, but I don't know, there's something about Instagram that's very easy to just be very honest and open and my photos are never edited, like, they're very raw, let's say, of just like things that go wrong as well. I'm not um, precious about what I share on there so much, so I think that's quite a good gateway into learning about customising. If people are a bit like curious or unsure, um, then they can sort of see like the how horses go from like the mega ugly phases because I think a lot of artists hide that even though we all know that a horse at some point looks like a giant orange blob um, to, to like when they look remotely horse-like so I think that's that's what um, is quite cool about that 
Um, in terms of up and coming things, I have like a few re-sculpts that I'm working on that I actually have here. So this horse is still very much in the ugly phase of re-sculpting, so just do a quick warning. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so I'm working on um, this one. It was the Bri Unicorn Xena. I'm, I'm unsure on how you say these things. Um, but yeah, so I'm just re-sculpting her. So she had like a, a completely re-sculpted head. I'm not sure if it's in focus, but hopefully it is. Uh, re-sculpted -re head in terms of like muzzle. Um, she's obviously got her original ears. Um, and then the, the mane is like half armature, which I will dremel down so it's smooth. And then half where I've started to like re-sculpt it back in. And then this side you can see like where the blue tape is that I use as the armature for sculpting. So yeah, she's still really rough. Um, and then I have one here that's like more in the finished sculpting stages. So he was um, part Bobby Joe, part Briar Picasso and part Silver. Um, so yeah, he's going to be like a fight. Well, not fighting, they're going to be like playing Mustangs in the field or something. Um, so yeah, so he's sculpted. He's in primer now, um, but you can see I think part like epoxy areas on him where I've been like refilling them back in. Um, so I'll prime a horse when I'm like mostly done just to see how much sanding needs to be done. I'm not a clean sculptor. People think my horses are really smooth. When they're finished, they are. <laughs> That's because they went through so much sanding. Um, but yeah, so they're kind of my ones that you can look out for that you'll probably see fairly soon. <laughs> So yeah, so that's that's me for the moment. <laughs> All right, and that's the episode. Thank you guys so much for watching and tuning in. Leave a comment below telling me what was your favorite part of the episode and did you learn something new? Make sure to go check out Harriet and all of her work. I will have all of the things she listed linked below in the description in case you want to check out the supplies that she uses as well as just go find her on social media. New episodes will be dropping every Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Next week, tune in for Anne Field of Field of Dolls Studio. Episodes will be posted weekly here on this YouTube channel, as well as Spotify and Apple Podcasts as soon as the show gets approved. I apologize that at the time of this show's launch, I have not yet been approved, but as soon as I am, that will go on to Spotify and Apple Podcasts as well, and you can expect future episodes to drop on all three of those platforms as well. Finally, go ahead and check out my Instagram, Frost Studios Equine Art, for more sneak peeks, teasers, and behind the scenes for the show. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you next week. Bye!